For this hour, I'm going to uh, blow up the, the normal rules of talk radio. And instead of being the uh, know-it-all talk show host here, uh, I'm, I'm inviting Dr. Justin Frank, a regular guest and friend of the show, uh, to be on our program. And for the next 60 minutes, for the next hour, you know, with, there's a few breaks in there, but uh, to take your calls and answer your questions. Uh, we're, we're, having, we're entering a very, very interesting time. Uh, first of all, Dr. Justin Frank is the psychoanalyst and clinical professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at George Washington University. He is the author of Trump on the Couch, Obama on the Couch, Bush on the Couch. Um, uh, we'll see if he does <laughs> Biden on the Couch. I don't know. His Twitter handle is Justin Frank MD, spelled just exactly like it sounds. And uh, first of all, Dr. Frank, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for joining us and for taking this hour to answer people's questions. Dr. Frank? Yeah. There you, you are. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Thank you for joining us. Okay, good. You're welcome. So, so, so this weekend, I, we had, for the very first time, it's, you know, in November, or excuse me, March 10th of last year was the last time Louise and I were out of the house and, uh, you know, in some place other than where we had to go to get vaccinated. And uh, the last time that we had, in fact, it was her birthday party, we had family and friends over and that was it. That was, you know, for, for it's been over a year now. And yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, we had... Uh, one of our kids and her partner, her wife and, and, and their kids and her, and, her, and her wife's parents and a whole bunch of people over here at the house and were all vaccinated. But I was still like really nervous. I was just like neurotic about it. And um, I think all of us, you know, need some um, handholding maybe is the wrong phrase, but, you know, would like to hear from a professional like yourself about how do we deal with things like the fear of going back into the office or of going back to school or of dining in a restaurant or going to a movie theater or the grocery store or crowded spaces or family coming over or getting on an airplane again or, or you know, how do we get back to normal or, or how have we recalibrated our understanding of of just like normal stuff, like giving people hugs when you see them, you know? Um, where do we begin with all that? And, you know, if, if you have some thoughts on that, and then, and then of course, uh, as people call in, I'll, I'll put them on the air with you and they can ask you very specific questions. Um, but, you know, what's, what's your sense of where we're at, what we've lost, what kind of trauma we've experienced and how we need to recover from it, sir? Well, we're at a place where there has been a shared trauma that I think has been shared by more people than shared the fear of Trump or the fear of Biden. I think and that's the fear of COVID. And how we've been indoors for a year or more, uh, I think, contributes to that fear. And so there's what's called, uh, in a traditional psychiatry, we talk about PTSD, post-traumatic stress dis uh, disorder. This is really uh, related to that, which is anxiety about uh, being afraid again. First of all, there's fear of fear. So I think that when you rega regroup with your family, Tom, it's like there's a fear that somebody's going to get sick and you're almost afraid of being afraid. And the problem with fear is that it interferes with thinking very often and can cause uh, paralysis of, of action and behavior. As we know, thinking is a basically trial action, so you need to think and then to But I think the biggest thing is there's two terms that have come out of this uh, pandemic that have uh, <clears throat> influenced me. One is called decision fatigue, which I really like, which is a concept that has been advanced in the last few months about people who have so many things to think about and too many things to decide that they don't know which to do first. So like when you have your family over, do you clean everything up? Does everybody wear masks indoors? I mean, what are you going to do? And how close will you get? And will you hug? And the second one uh, really has to do with the fact that there really is a COVID anxiety disorder, which is the thing that we're all suffering from. And I think that that's... Uh, been described more in Great Britain than in here as, as a specific term, but I like that term also. So I think that there are universal fears and anxieties. 
The thing about fear is that it can be paralyzing. At the same time, getting sick and getting COVID is a real cause of anxiety. Now, one of the things that has happened in the past in in terms of large groups, which America really is, even though we have lots of differences and lots of polarized situations, there's a large group phenomenon that is a shared fear of going wrong, of some kind of invasion. That's what Trump tapped into when he, he talked about Mexican rapists in 2015. So I think that we've had an experience of shared fears. And then the uh, liberals have been afraid of Trump destroying the Constitution. Uh, Chris Christie yesterday on TV talked about a fear of socialism if uh, taxes, corporate taxes are raised. So fear is one of the things that's part of our, in our blood, in American blood. And the fear is of invasion, of some kind of enemy treatment for any kind of bacterial invasion is vaccination or reducing exposure. So the more we are vaccinated, the less we are going to be afraid of invasion in terms of literally afraid. Um, and I think that right now, I think Americans are vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, then there's lots of questions about that. Do you wear a mask? What do you do? And there's all kinds of differences of opinion. I don't think I I've answered it. your question, but <laughs> no, no, I think it's a, it's a great start, and and we've got and we've got some folks on the line who want to talk to you. So let's just go to that. Our telephone number, by the way, well, if you would like to sit, speak with uh, Professor and Doctor uh, Doctor Justin Frank, the psychiatrist, is two zero two eight zero eight ninety nine twenty five. Uh, Howard in New York City, and we have about uh, what two minutes until the break. Howard, you're on the air with Doctor no Frank. Problem. Yeah, um, one of the great problems we have. Of the 53 million people that have been brainwashed to believe the big lie. That's a result of Rupert Murdoch, and uh, it's about uh, $3 billion they spent on all the airwaves and the social network. How could we possibly reverse that without getting the same volume on the airwaves and spending the same money to try and reverse some of it? That is one of the best questions ever, uh, because... Uh, there uh, are networks that are focused on brainwashing versus in, that are trying to talk about science and allay people's fears. Um, and I think that it's very hard to uh, – the, the most important thing to do, unfortunately, is we have to act on an individual basis within our own families and friends who are among those 53 million brainwashed people. And that – listening to them, that in my view, listening is the new talking, and it's important to pay attention to what their fears are. My view is we have to move from Matt, American great again, to MANA and make American normal again. And the question is, what is normal? But we have to move to a place where we're not so afraid of interacting with each other. The problem is so many people from the Murdoch group are anti-maskers, they're anti-vaxxers, some of them, and they really are uh, very, very angry and suspicious. And I think the problem is how to help people allay their suspicions, and the best way is to ask them what they're afraid of and why, why they don't like you or why they don't, what they're afraid of me about. And that's not on national media, that's an individual process. Emford, Connecticut, you are on the air with Dr. Justin Frank. Hi, Dr. Frank. How are you? Hi. How are you, John? Uh, how are you? Okay. Sean. Um, I happen to have a psych background, so this topic fascinates me. And when the uh, pandemic first came about a year or so ago, I realized that we we're going to see a new kind of mental health condition that encompasses uh, paranoia, germophobia, and agoraphobia. And I wonder what your thoughts were on that, because it seems to be happening as we speak. Well, one of the things is, uh, I, can you hear me? Because the, suddenly the sound has changed from uh, yeah. a clear it, sound it, it, to it, a it, different it, sound. I, I'm not sure what happened. It sound, I, I can't see what's going on, but it sounds like you're on speakerphone now rather than a regular phone. But, um, but, but I can hear you, so, so just keep going. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. 
you know, those questions, the question is very important because uh, I had a, actually a patient who um, told me after Trump was elected in 2016, the day after, said to me on the phone, because I was in uh, D.C. And, and this person was in New York City, that they were afraid to go outside because they couldn't tell who voted for Trump and who didn't because people looked the same. And there was such fear right away. Uh, so I think that fear exists on both sides. And the problem is uh, that's one of the things that is, has really uh, kind of impeded people's growth and development psychologically as individuals and as a group. So I think you're right. There's going to be a new syndrome that we have to deal with. And that syndrome, which we haven't really described yet, is about uh, not knowing what to believe and what to think. Uh, one of the things that Trump said that was very dangerous and disturbing was, don't believe what you see. It may not be true. And, of course, uh, we can't see this virus. And so don't believe what you see when a person is wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. Then we're afraid that other people haven't been vaccinated when they say they have. I have just started seeing patients in my office for the first time in over a year. And I see very few of them, and only the ones who've been vaccinated and we sit far apart. But I have to tell you, I'm as anxious about doing this again, even though I couldn't stand remote uh, psychotherapy. I think the syndrome is going to be one of mutual fear, mutual suspicion, and almost like uh, finding a way to talk to people uh, when you can recognize the fear that you have, but also the fear in the other person. So one of the things that's important to be able to do is to be able to say, hi, I'm scared too, or hi, uh, how are you doing? I'm like, the first question you asked me before you asked your question was, how am I doing? That's a great thing to ask for people. And you want to do that to allay some of their fears and their suspicions. But I think we're going to see a whole new uh, kind of syndrome of people who have reactivated OCD, obsessional compulsive disorder, people who are going to be uh, obsessed with hygiene, and people who are going to do all those kinds of things. And we need to just be patient. Some of them need professional help, help, but a lot of them are really uh, in trouble, and they can uh, kind of spread that anxiety in the workplace and at home. I think there's parental fears, too about what do you do with unvaccinated children who come home from school when you've been vaccinated? Right. I mean, there's all that was through a huge family Thanksgiving. Last year, my husband told them it wasn't safe to have it. They invited us for Christmas. We didn't go. They sent us photos of 20 of them next to each other, shoulder to shoulder, no masks, no vaccines. And then we were relieved we didn't go. I fear this Thanksgiving this year, and there are five children and a teenager, too, and um, I don't want to have it, but I don't know what's going to happen, so help me help me have a reassurance somehow. Well, first of all, it's very hard uh, to be close to some people who are anti-vaxxers. Uh, and I think that you have, and the hardest thing is to stick with your own uh, need for safety. Uh, theoretically, uh, it's about making your family safe and keeping it safe. But if there's lots of family members who don't agree with that, uh, it's very hard to know what to say, except that you can't go until they get vaccinated. Um, and you're not, and the other thing is that you're not trying to be coercive. You don't want to force them to get vaccinated, but you'd be happy to listen to what it is that they're concerned about. Um, and the, again, it's about trying to listen to them. But, you're, but I think protecting yourself is, comes first. And uh, I think your own concerns are very legitimate and realistic. I mean, the problem of returning to normal life is that there's a way in which unselfconsciousness <clears throat> may be lost for good. I mean, that's what troubles me, 
that we used to be able to just be friends and not be self-conscious. And now, you know, instead of hugging, we shake hands by elbow bumps or fist bumps. And we keep our distance, at least I do, with my, with people I know. When I've been with people who've been vaccinated in the last uh, few weeks, I've occasionally given a hug or gotten a hug. Uh, but I wear my mask even now, uh, much of the time. Um, I don't know what to say specifically, except that there needs to be some way of not so much focusing on the fears but focusing with your relatives, that we're all in the same boat. The boat is a boat of COVID and a boat of Americans and a boat of family. There's more than one boat. And I think the question is, which boat are you all going to try to be in with the reality of COVID? It's not like a, it's not like a fake illness. It really can happen. And the feeling of being immune is, in my view, uh, you can't say this to your relatives, but it's a bit grandiose and manic. It's a denial of relevance, and it's a denial of vulnerability. And uh, it's like a triumph over anxiety by saying, I'm going to be able to do this. It's, a, it's what we call, in my field, counterphobic behavior. So they're going to send you all these pictures of having a great old time. And hopefully nobody in that family is getting sick. Uh, I don't know what else to say except I stick by your guns. It's very hard. And with your kids, you can just talk to them. Listen to the, what they're worried about and what they feel bad about missing their family. And maybe you can share with your family a sense of loss with the other people. And that this isn't really, this is about what to do about a shared loss and a shared common set of love that you have for each other, and what about trying to uh, accommodate other people's uh, differences for one dinner? Maybe you could have a, a Thanksgiving without masks for everybody else, and a Thanksgiving that's safer or outdoors or wherever it will be in November uh, for everybody. It's uh, two days, you know, Thursday, Thanksgiving. But I, I don't know. But there needs to be some way of recognizing what you have in common. And there's a lot of love between family members that can be obscured by this. I don't think we just have four. What best I can do. Yeah, we just have 30 we're seconds to the break. So basically, don't don't confront your family and tell them they're delusional. Instead, uh, you know, treat them oh. with love, but respect. No, no delusional talk. But the interesting yeah. thing is about what we have in common. Because it's not only that we have fear in common, we have love in common. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and we have a desire to be together. It's natural. Dr. Justin Frank is with us for the hour, taking your calls on, uh, you know, COVID and this time and this transition. And we're coming out of it. And we've got about half of Americans vaccinated. And what do we do? And how do we deal with all these things? And et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Frank, you're still with us. Everything's good? I'm still with you. Everything's good. Okay, okay great. Jonathan in Portland, Oregon, you are on the air with Dr. Frank. Hi, Tom. Hi, Dr. Frank. So, I, uh, Dr. Frank, I wanted to know your opinion of this. My, my, my assessment of what's going on psychologically with Trump supporters is um, exemplified in a quote by Charlie Chan, which is that ignorance is undefeatable in argument. I've seen, I've seen close friends of mine from childhood that I think were bullied, and I think that they have found – um, <clears throat> refuge in ignorance that's undefeatable. They've created a citadel of ignorance. And no matter what you do, <clears throat> they, they, are, they always win. They're impervious to reason. And I think it's a reaction possibly to feeling bullied or to feeling insecure or to feeling fear. And I just want to know your opinion about that. My opinion is the same as yours. It's related to having been bullied or being afraid and not wanting to know things. But this history is not just uh, recent with Trump. It's a long history in terms of the Know Nothing Party from uh, the turn of the last century, where people were proud to know nothing. That's how smart I am. 
That's what they would say. Then they would go on and talk about how successful they are. And Trump's father was very clear about that. More recently, when Trump was a kid, Trump's father had a brother, uh, Donald's uncle, who went to MIT. And he said, my, uh, my brother is very smart, but he doesn't have any money like I have. He doesn't know what he's doing. He invents things and thinks about things. And he's a smart guy. But, I mean, that doesn't do anything for him. So there's a great uh, deal, a, a sense of pride and power in being ignorant. But the problem with it also is that people who are ignorant are not as ignorant as you think or as I think. I actually think that the people we say who are ignorant, like mass deniers and science deniers, do know a lot. But they don't know things that are true. So that's the part that becomes even more of a problem because the people who watch Fox News know a lot. They know what Fox News said. They remember it. They think about it. So they're not ignorant in the traditional sense of somebody who's never read or can't, you know, can't spell or doesn't know anything. They know a lot of things. And the problem is how to deal with people who know a lot that's very different from you. And again, I can only say that the best way, it's going to have to be very slow. It's going to be trickle up rather than trickle down. And that means trickling up with individual connections with your friends and family and listening to them and talking with them about what they're worried about and not arguing about it, but seeing what it is that you can agree about. I mean, people may, we may share similar fears that, uh, we come at the solutions for them from different perspectives. And there are certain hot button issues that lead to uh, rage reactions, like you're saying, of setting up all the walls and the citadels, and then there's no way to have a conversation. Um, so I do think we're in a dangerous time where we're, we're, we're more divided in a certain way that is really very powerful. I think there's always been a history of divisions from way before the Civil War. There were divisions. I live in the swamp right now, Washington, D.C., and the divisions that went on when they were writing the Constitution were that they didn't want my city where I live to be a state because they were afraid of too much influence from local residents on national government. So we have no influence rather than any. We have none. We have no senators, no Congress, no governor, nothing. So, so I think that fear has always been there, and it's become to a head with the Trump administration. And unfortunately, you would think that COVID could unite us more, because there's a common thing that everybody's afraid of getting sick, and that hasn't done the trick. I wish I could. Mary. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were right. finished. Yeah. yeah. No, that's okay. Ma Ma I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. Mary in Eureka, California, you are on the air with Dr. Frank. Yes. My uh, question is that why do we have so many great numbers that are this in this denial? maybe in the millions, the numbers. And number two, <clears throat> I'm 90 years old. I've never seen a time when government governors and political leaders um, are just so divided on a medical issue. I mean, this is medical. Thanks. Yes, it is. It is medical, and it's very much about a, there has been a long fear in this country of invasion. I don't know how else to say it, but we have a shared unconscious fantasy, all of us as a group, that is related to almost a paranoid fear of some form of invasion. And so people in the 60s and 50s, really, under McCarthy, were afraid of communist invasion. They were going to come. We used to have humorists who were very funny. they say, oh, my God, there's a communist. They're crawling up my leg. What am I going to do? They're going to kill me. I mean, this is like people would make fun of it, but there were a whole group of people who were terrified. And I think that that has persisted to the present day in different forms. Usually some kind of attack like Nazi Germany temporarily unites us when we fought against Germany and Japan in World War II. But we got divided very quickly within a few years by Joe McCarthy. It's happening again. And the covid is a very scary thing because people really are science deniers. The other th reason for it, if you want to talk about it, thinking about it, 
is that what if you have a fixed idea, your fixed idea, the purpose of a fixed idea is to protect you from anxiety, protect you from worry, protect you from fear. So the fixed idea is that uh, pol- some politicians are liars, that governments, governors are uh, are are liars if they're saying a certain thing. So what you have when you have a fixed idea is you become closed to anything else. So somebody who wears a mask makes you anxious. Somebody who doesn't wear a mask makes other people anxious. We have a fixed idea. And one of the problems with fixed ideas is it does not tolerate complexity, variability, variety. So when somebody is not wearing a mask, I immediately might assume, oh, That person's a racist. That person's a this. That person's a that. And they may not be. All those are assumptions that you make because one weird thing that somebody does makes all of your certainty go up in smoke. And certainty has been a defense against anxiety. James in Lakewood, Washington, you're on with Dr. Frank. We have two minutes to a break. Hey, Tom, Dr. Franks, you were... um, uh, you wrote you wrote the series on on the couch books, one with Junior Bush, and I was wondering how, with him coming out of his hole of late, how that correlates in your mind, how it how you feel it correlates with the um, COVID response of um, uh, Joe Biden and uh, how he's uh, doing the the COVID response as we uh, perceive it. I think uh, there's something that's happened to uh, George Bush Jr. And I don't know if it's from his experience painting, from his friendship, uh, somewhat distant but real, with Michelle Obama. But for some reason, he's moved a little bit away from an either-or view of the world. His view was you're with us or you're with the terrorists. You're with us or you're against us. But that was always based on foreign policy and not so much domestically. So I don't think that he's changed that much necessarily that he also uses certainty as a defense against anxiety. But he can see that people get sick. He is actually has the capacity that Donald Trump does not, which he has a capacity for empathy and for feeling uh, uh, the pain of other people. He won't talk about it that much, but he's aware of it. And then when you're painting, you lose yourself in the face and in the figures of the subjects that you're painting. And he just came out with a book of paintings of immigrants. I mean, this is a man who has changed and grown. And I think that it's possible to grow, even at an older age. It's good news. <laughs> That's good news. Dr. Justin Frank taking your calls for the hour here on the Tom Hartman program. We'll be back. You can tweet him at uh, Justin Frank MD. And welcome back, James in Spokane, Washington. You're on the air with Dr. Frank. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, I, I have to say this. I know a little bit about Freud's teachings and a little about Young's, and I, I'm on board for most of it, honest to goodness. Uh, Young said it best when he said we're all recovering children. Um, it seems human nature is that at this point throughout history, we're very neurotic, and uh, the people that percolate to the top, unfortunately, tend to be the psychotics. And, uh, you know, if we don't own the fact that we're mentally ill, it's like anything else. We're not going to make any headway in changing anything at all if we're going to be in the mad little monkeys we are and not owning it individually. What do you think? I, what do we do I about think the billionaires? you're absolutely I, well, I'm, I'm worried about what we do about ourselves. I think what you started out saying is what about the fact that we all have certain things in common with uh, other people, which that we all have some form of psychological conflict, uh, what you call mental, mental illnesses. I was trained uh, as a therapist in Boston where psychotherapy was defined by my main mentor as a big mess taking care of a bigger mess. So that's important to bear in mind. And I think that the people who point fingers, even us at the billionaires or the billionaires at us, need to look inside about what it is that we're denying in ourselves, what it is that we're pointing fingers about and how that reflects ourselves. I think that the healthy 
uh, solution is to really understand that, um, th- that you need to really look at yourselves. So then when you hear Chris Christie like yesterday saying that corporate tax is going to bring us socialism, that is something that you need to address because that is fanning the flames of fear and paranoid anxiety. And that's used in order to control other people and to keep other people from speaking. But it's also used by billionaires to keep their money because they don't want to let go of it now that they've got it. And um, that was the reason why Trump was so popular with wealthy people in the first place, because of his uh, attitude towards regulation and his um, dramatic lowering of taxes. I think that we need, though, to recognize ourselves so we'll be able to listen better to other people and look at what we have in common. But I do think action is needed, and we do need to face the facts that there are lots of people who are not really interested in, uh, shall we say, even in democracy. To, uh, we just have uh, 40 seconds here. Um, to to uh, Young's comment that we're all recovering children, is that, a, is that a, yes. uh, a, an entry point for conversation with others? Not explicitly, yes, but I implicitly? It, I think it's the issue is to be able to say we're all recovering children and to say I'm one of them. These are the mm-hmm. things from my childhood, because if we just say you're a recovering child, even though you say we're all, you don't then start and say, well, tell me why you're a recovering child. I want to talk about my, the nature of my recovering child, my fear of the dark or whatever it was, and that there are certain things that are real that we share. It is yeah. a good entree, yeah. entree. I agree with that. Yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Dr. Justin Frank with us, taking your calls for the hour. We'll be back with more of your calls for Dr. Frank. Dr. Justin Frank taking your calls for the hour. And uh, Mark in Salem, Oregon, you're on the air with Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank, uh, welcome. Uh, 20 seconds set up and a question. I, I was watching several news programs over the weekend about vaccine hesitancy, and they all had the same formula. They start out growing hesitancy about vaccines. Then they talk about X number of people have had this bad reaction and someone here died. And then they talk to a uh, professional or or a legislator or a public official and they say, well, to get more people vaccinated, we need education. And then, so this whole long article, two or three minutes, and not once in any of these articles did the, the station or the news program state with the tiny fraction of 1% you have of having a bad reaction from a vaccine. Other parts of the newscast, they talk about millions of people being vaccinated, but on this part of the newscast, they talk about the exceptions, and they never tell you what your chances are of actually having a bad reaction. My question is, what is the responsibility of the news organizations to give us the true facts, and isn't the mainstream media actually increasing and promoting this hesitancy by not telling us what our low chances of having a bad reaction is. I think, yes, they are. They're increasing anxiety, increasing anti-vax feelings, the mainstream media. Uh, I am not don't have enough power to deal with the mainstream media, but they do need to be more responsive and responsible because the percentage of infections is extraordinarily low. I think that they get more uh, viewers if they scare people, and fear has always been part of American politics. I mean, the yellow journalism, William Randolph Hearst, uh, it's always been there, fear of communism, fear of germs. Uh, Now it's fear of vaccines and side effects of vaccines. Fear is the dominant thing, and it needs to be faced. Anxiety is reasonable to be nervous about COVID. Some people are even nervous about vaccines, and I understand that. People don't like to have foreign uh, substances put in their body, although they'll go and uh, not question uh, who bottled their uh, Budweiser. I just think it's really a problem, and the networks need to uh, grapple with it, and we need to write letters to them. I don't know how else to deal with it because they do sell more, they get more viewers when they uh, stoke fears. But you're absolutely right. 
the percentage of any kind of side effect that's negative, especially serious illness or serious side effects, is infinitesimal. Infinitesimal. And Rennie, uh, it just is. I'm, I'm sorry. Rennie I'm in uh, Reno, Nevada. You're on the air with Dr. Frank. Hey, Dr. Frank, in your educated Hi. professional Hi. opinion, you have uh, been uh, trained to analyze people's thoughts and behavior. My question is, what do you think is going on in the minds of the Republicans for the end game of the utopian United States? What is it supposed to look like in their minds, in your educated opinion? Oh. In my in my educated opinion, there's a shared fantasy that many Republicans have, which is not that different from the shared fantasy that slave owners had. I hate to say it, but there is a shared fantasy of purity, of white purity, and of, con and of getting rid of contaminants. Contaminants include brown-skinned people, immigrants, black people, anybody who doesn't fit in to a united America. It's not that it's different from what went on in Germany to some extent, but the same idea is there. The fear that contaminants can never be part of the nation. And in, the, in Germany, it was the Jews. I don't know what else they have in mind, but it really is about some form of purity. And if you're not pure, you need to live in a gated community to keep other people out. And there are more and more gated communities cropping up in this country, and they're very Republican. They're very white, and they're very dominated by fear. Yeah. Uh, Professor Frank, we have just one minute to the end of the hour. Um, best advice or thoughts on people for this period of transition? <clears throat> Well, I think we need to know about the walls. I'm a child of the 60s, so I just found myself, when you asked that question, wanting to sing that song about up against the wall, you know, tear down the walls. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really yeah. think it's important to tear down the walls, Mother Effer, because you got to do it. There are walls, and we need to find what's on the other side and talk to them. Yeah. Okay, I got it. I love it. Dr. Frank, thank you so much. It's always great having you on the program. Thank you so much for dropping by. Thank today. you. My pleasure. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. In the meantime, don't forget, democracy is not a spectator sport. It requires all of us, and that includes you more than ever. And consider calling your favorite star stores and letting them know that you'll be happy to come back when they require everybody to show proof of vaccination before they can come in the store. I think we can create a movement.